Hi again, and welcome. My name is Cyrus Worlds, and I'm Director of Programs at the Institute for Spirituality and Health in the Texas Medical Center. And for those who may be joining uh, for the first time or for the first time in a long time to an ISH program, the Institute for Spirituality and Health uh, was founded in 1955 and was actually the first nationally accredited chaplaincy training program. And we were founded with the uh, purpose of restoring the humanity and spirituality to, to medicine and healthcare. And over our 65 year history, we've done a great variety of things and we continue to do a great variety of things, all geared towards serving our mission of enhancing well being by exploring the relationship between spirituality and health. And of course, often the first question people ask when we say spirituality and health is, are you affiliated with a particular religion or church or what do you mean by spirituality? Um, and we take many definitions and we are open to anyone's definition of what spirituality means to them and how they find meaning and connection in life. But a definition we like to use comes from our president, Reverend Dr. John Graham, who says that spirituality involves our innate ability as humans to connect, to connect with one another, to connect with the environment, to connect with the transcendent mystery that many of us call God or may name or not name, and to connect with ourselves. And I think tonight, all of those forms of connection will be at play, but perhaps the one that is most um, present in, in the forefront is the connection with others through the process of caregiving, which we see often in our work at ISH as a very spiritual relationship. And that can be whether it's in the clinic or at home. So very grateful to have our three panelists tonight and to introduce them uh, we will have dr virgil fry who's the mastermind behind this program on spiritual resilience this three-part series on spiritual resilience through crisis and transition and before we begin um, something we like to do leading into a lot of our programs all of them really um, is to just take a moment to arrive. So wherever you are in this space, in your space and in this shared space, take a moment to breathe in and breathe out and feel gravity rooting you into the place where you are today at this time. Let the dust of the day's activities settle. Let your inner waters become calm. And let your ears be open to listen. Let your eyes be open to see and let your heart be open to feel and know. Take a deep breath. And one more. Letting yourself show up exactly as you are right now in company with your fellow human beings. And with a few gentle blinks, you can let your eyes open.
coming back together in this space. So thank you all again so much for being here. Thanks to our speakers and thank you, Virgil. And with that, the floor is yours. Well, I liked, uh, liked it when you said mastermind. I don't get called that very often. So but, uh, thank you, Cyrus. Um, this is a topic that uh, is extremely important. I've been a chaplain for uh, a number of years and uh, learned a great deal from uh, people who were often sitting bedside in the hospital uh, rooms. And I can't tell you how many times I would hear from uh, caregivers, family members or friends or whoever was sitting there. Uh, I don't know why I'm so tired. I'm just sitting here all day. And uh, the truth is you're not just sitting there. You're, you're alert. You're, you're listening to everything. Hospitals are, are busy, noisy places, if that's where you are. And um, it's, uh, it's taxing. It takes a lot out of you to do that kind of caregiving in a hospital room. Beyond that, uh, uh, the medical world that we live in often asks family members and caregivers or somebody to provide medical care as well as emotional and spiritual support uh, in a person's home. Uh, people are sent home a day or two after surgery. And um, often it's other people that wind up having to take care of that need uh, that don't feel medically trained to do so and don't know much uh, about it, uh, but, but you choose to do so at times. Sometimes being a caregiver is forced upon you. Sometimes children are put in the role of having to be caregivers uh, just because of the crisis that's going on at the moment. So it's a very important topic to talk about. We don't uh, often share uh, with each other. Caregivers can often find each other and they know what they're talking about. When you're in the middle of, of crisis management, which caregiving is, whether it's for chronic illness or, a, or imposed serious illness or an accident or whatever has been the source of it, what I find is caregivers find it hard to, to, to minister to themselves, to take care of their own needs in addition to taking care of the other. Uh, they don't want to, in a hospital, they don't often want to leave the room. Uh, I often would try to get people to go out and get a cup of coffee with me and, and they'd, they'd be reluctant to do so. And, you know, sometimes I would say, you know, taking care of yourself gives you the opportunity to be better fit to take care of this person. Uh, sometimes many of us are wired not to, not to think that, that way, uh, but that is actually the truth. In the time of COVID, we have found out extremely uh, well, uh, too well, how important supportive care is. Uh, all the staff chaplains that work within hospitals have told me story after story of patients that have been alone uh, in surgery. They've been alone in the ICU. Uh, nobody was able to come in when the uh, pandemic was at its worst. And uh, many times a chaplain couldn't even enter the room as a person was dying. Uh, he or she would hold up an iPad to the window of the intensive care unit so that the family members could participate in the passing, the, the transition through death that way. Very unnatural, very, very, uh, we're just not geared to, to, to be that way. Uh, and that's been forced upon us. So many times staff members have become caregivers in addition to uh, um, what families used to have done and what, what uh, clergy and, and others might have been on, on the spiritual and emotional basis. So this is a personal topic to me. I'll tell you a little bit more about my story in, in a few minutes. Uh, it's not just an academic subject, but first I wanna go through just a few things by sharing my screen, if I can get everything to work here. And I'm now screen sharing, okay. I need to get rid of you. Um, there we go. I need to get rid of you. And you did just the opposite, okay. <laughs> you can click over on the PowerPoint window. Over you just gotta right. look. There we go, there we go. Um, and I wanna do the slideshow and I want it full. 
I'll get there. Give me a moment. All right. Look at that. And I need to minimize you folks so I can see the screen as well. That I, that's very helpful to me. It's, it's called Self-Care, the Path to Wholeness. And she talks about uh, people that were taking care of, I think particularly hospice folks. I cannot count the times family caregivers have whispered to me, I want my life back. They utter this confession with as much guilt as love, wondering where the familiar patterns went and being fearful about the future. The truth is no one takes our lives away. We give them over by leaving ourselves out of our own caring circle. The litany of long-term caregiver health complaints include fatigue, guilt, anxiety, stress, frustration, isolation, depression, anger, and resentment. Being consumed with caregiving sets the stage for self-neglect. So I think this is a helpful corrective sometimes and maybe to realize if you're in the caregiving uh, motif now uh, that all of these things often go with it and uh, self-neglect is often a response that's, that's pretty unhealthy for us in the long term. Sometimes we have to do that out of the crisis, but there are times when we just have to pull back and let others step in for us. This uh, is a very personal uh, encounter for me, uh, not only because of, of my role as a chaplain and the training that I do, but uh, my own personal life dealt with uh, my wife of 33 years, Carol, who was a type one diabetic for 50 years and a very vivacious, uh, loving, caring uh, teacher, mother to our children, uh, very involved with our faith community and uh, was a uh, insulin dependent diabetic uh, ever since about the age of four and a half. So she lived with it a long time. She was, she was taught how to manage it herself uh, and uh, did very well with that. She often didn't think she did, but she actually did or she wouldn't have lived as long as she did without the, the major problems. We did have some snags along the way after we got married. Uh, she had some times when uh, things did not go well. Um, uh, particularly with her eyes. Uh, she was one of the early people that was being treated with a uh, uh, very strong laser for the retina because of bleeding. Blindness often can go with uh, uncontrolled, uh, being diabetic uncontrolled. After many years of dealing with it, she also had a lot of cardiovascular problems. She had a lot of neuropathy uh, in her legs and feet uh, and, and that caused her quite a bit of problems. But the last year and a half of her life is really when things began to shut down. She had to go on uh, medical disability and uh, through her doctor. And that was, very, that was a huge grief for her. She was not ready to do that. Um, but he said, you cannot just keep teaching. You can't stand on these feet uh, where you stood on a, a broken leg that had two broken bones in it for, for a month uh, without even knowing it. Um, so I want you to stay busy. I want you to stay involved, but you cannot do teaching. And that began for me a very personal shift as well, because I'm working full time, working with Lifeline Chaplaincy and trying to keep all of those plates spinning. Um, but I also had to shift my attention and share it with her. And I saw her uh, go through so much with uh, basically depression and guilt and sadness, uh, trying to do the best she could with what she was given. And then uh, as happens often, her kidneys began to shut down and her nephrologist wanted me to, to uh, try this machine of doing uh, the dialysis of taking her blood out and cleansing it and putting it back in uh, at home, uh, which I was very reticent to do because it's asking a lot of somebody to do that. It's a huge responsibility. Uh, but I had a nurse train me on how to do it and I agreed to do it. Uh, but that took about three hours each time we did it. And that was for um, uh, three times a week at first, and then it was four times a week. So that was 12 hours right there, uh, uh, just on dialysis. Uh, even, uh, even doing the, the spinning of the blood afterwards and sending off the samples and doing all the things that you would do in a, in a clinic. 
And there were times when she would have to go into a clinic. There was times that she had to be hospitalized for, for multiple things. But primarily that was up to me, that, that plus being a case manager. Uh, I cannot even remember. I think at one time I counted seven different doctors or clinics that we were involved with the last uh, couple of years of her life and uh, just made all kinds of trips. And, uh, but nobody ever really talked to her about uh, when is enough enough for you? When, do you, when would you like uh, to consider stopping this? So she kept going and I'm a chaplain. I've often talked to other people about when is enough enough, uh, but I couldn't do it with her. It's very different when it's your own family member. And so I learned the fatigue of, of trying to just keep up with what was going on with her, what she was going through and how I was losing the person that I had been with for so long, even though she was still with me, her personality was, was changing somewhat. And uh, she became much more dependent on me, which she despised. And I found very taxing, but we did it. Uh, we were committed to do it with each other. Uh, she finally passed away in uh, 2007. And uh, it was after that that I really began, actually through a therapeutic relationship, began to look at a lot of my grief that I'd been stuffing away was also the care that I was providing for her personally and the loss that I was feeling during that time that we were doing all the medical stuff uh, in addition to her death. So uh, I, I'm very adamant that caregivers need to be supported. They need to be told. Uh, it's okay to take care of yourself as well. So that's where I'm coming from. Uh, in addition to this wonderful panel that we have together, I wanna talk about a few things that I think are important to remember about caregiving. Caregivers are crucial to anyone enduring serious illness. God indeed made us social creatures. Again, this got, is getting proven even now with the limitations being put on the hospital visits. Caregiving is a balancing act requiring great amounts of energy and selflessness. Uh, it's just amazing uh, what you sign up for when you agree to be a caregiver or if it's thrust upon you, perhaps if you're a child. It just takes a lot. There's nothing quite normal anymore. Bills keep going on. Uh, uh, if you have children, they have to be uh, dealt with with school or whatever it is that they have going on. Uh, the house has to be taken care of, the car has to be serviced, all of those things go on. And if you're working, all of that continues in addition to what you're doing as a caregiver. Caregivers' needs are often the last to be addressed. The one in health crisis takes priority, but the family's life needs are also ongoing. <clears throat> a change in one's role in, in the family is a major adjustment and may not be immediately acknowledged as loss. Uh, and actually it's grief. We don't often call that kind of loss grief, but it is. There is a grieving process of losing what was and knowing that in many ways it will never go back to being that again. Caregivers can find it difficult to differentiate between themselves and the patient. Uh, sometimes when I visit uh, patients and there's a caregiver that's, that's been there a long time with them, uh, I'll ask the patient, you know, how's it going? And the caregiver answers on behalf of the patient, though the patient may be perfectly capable of answering. And they'll, they'll sometimes use a language like, yeah, we're going down for our radiation after a while. And uh, speak in the, in the plural uh, rather than the singular. And I understand that you sometimes you get so enmeshed with what's going on that sometimes uh, you think it's your radiation too, even though it's not you on the machine getting the radiation or whatever the treatment is. Um, and it's understandable. It's also very um, taxing and unhealthy to stay in that way. Waiting, which there's a lot of waiting and caregiving, meeting physical and emotional demands, being an advocate with the medical world, that in itself is, is a lot to put on people. And maintaining hope are difficult shoes to fill. Most of us feel ill-equipped. It actually helps someone who's in their medical care to have a caregiver go with them and listen to the medical jargon that's used. Uh, doctors and nurses and, and med techs and all of those people are extremely well-trained and we need them and we appreciate them but they often speak in a language that we don't quite understand because we haven't had to deal with, with what they're talking about. 
So it's helpful to realize that is a difficult place to be. Caring for long-term or chronic illness is extremely taxing and is difficult to describe to those outside the caregiving environment. Uh, sometimes uh, I think about uh, meeting up with people or being on the, the metro train with them or being in a worship service with them. And we don't have any idea, we don't have a clue what's going on in their lives that they may be taken care of uh, that's not described easily. And uh, we ask them how they are and they give the proper answer of fine and then we move on. But if you're taking care of someone with uh, a long-term illness, one that's not going to get better, which would be a chronic illness that can be managed but not uh, done away with or, or healed, it's very taxing. Treasured supporters, those that support particularly caregivers, often quietly offer shared prayers, a listening ear, a coffee visit, a running of errands and presence. Those are the people I remember that stepped in for me and uh, you never forget it. Not only is the person who's dealing with the illness uh, needy, but so is the one providing the care. Now we're gonna hear from this panel. Uh, these three are going to present in this order. I'm gonna stop sharing here and get back to you guys. We are uh, really honored to have uh, Chelsea Sargent. Chelsea is a good friend of mine. Um, very remarkable support to uh, my family that lives here in Houston in many ways. She's a therapist by training. She's uh, working on a doctorate now to complete additional work in that. Uh, and it's just uh, a wonderful human being uh, all the way around, just the kind you like to be around. Uh, my, my grandkids uh, particularly are fond of her uh, when she does preaching and uh, uh, because she is so personal and how she presents things and so realistic. So it, it's, it's wonderful to have you with us, Chelsea. After that, Rodney Waller will join us. Rodney's in Arlington, Texas. He's uh, uh, on the executive board of Lifeline Chaplaincy, uh, quite involved in the leadership role within his church there. Uh, and he's going to talk about the role that he now assumes as caregiver for uh, his, his wonderful wife, who they've been married a long time and had a very fruitful and loving relationship, but she's dealing with uh, a form of dementia that has really incapacitated her and, and he is providing almost full-time care for her, uh, except like for tonight, he said he would have to get somebody to help be with her there in the house uh, because she wanders a lot. So he'll be talking about that in a very real way. And thank you, Rodney, for joining us. And then following uh, Rodney will be Dawn Landry. I just got to know Dawn recently. She's actually the author of a book on caregiving that's been very well received. And uh, she can talk about that, but she came out of her own personal experience of being a caregiver on three different major times for her husband. And uh, some of that is still ongoing and she can tell us a little bit about that as well. But she, uh, uh, is one of those, she calls herself a reluctant caregiver, and I think that would fit most of us in many ways, uh, but she is uh, very faith-oriented and decided that she would do this uh, and even to write the book out of a, an idea of helping others. So with those introductions, uh, please uh, join with me uh, as we listen to Chelsea, Rodney, and then Don. Thank you for that introduction, Virgil. I am so glad to be sitting with, with y'all tonight. And I'm, I'm guessing familiar company, um, touching your life in one way or another with caregiving. Um, I, like Virgil said, I am a therapist here in Houston. I have a private practice not too far out of the med center. And so one of the things that I see in my office often is, is people who are caregiving coming in for support. That is definitely a branch of therapy that I offer. I'm also a trauma specialist and I sit with many women in infertility and do a lot with anxiety and depression. Um, and like Virgil said, I'm working on my doctorate and I incorporate the Enneagram and many things that I do. So those are all things that I blend together in my professional life to sit with others and uh, walk with them as they journey with whatever cards they have been dealt with life. And I have very personal 
uh, experience with caregiving. Mine starts when I was very young. I have a mother who has struggled with mental health issues her entire life and different diagnoses that we thought were just around mental health when I was growing up. So there'd be many days with depression and anxiety. Uh, she couldn't leave her room, uh, couldn't uh, go to work, uh, couldn't step into the functions uh, that she needed to for me and my sisters. And being raised in the kind of family that I was raised in, it wasn't talked about very much. And so my dad with the caregiving tried to shoulder a lot of that responsibility himself and didn't get a lot of support. So as a little, little girl growing up in that environment, watching that, and I have two younger sisters, I think a piece that I have noticed that has been missing is talking about the caregiving piece from a mental health perspective. Uh, a lot of people talk about illness, uh, physical illness, and walking with people in that. But there's also, if you were caregiving with someone with severe mental health issues and debilitations, I believe that that's a, a hole that is not addressed very often. And so uh, being little growing up in that environment, growing into a teenager and then an emerging adult, I didn't find a lot of support within that. And because it wasn't talked about very much, I didn't really know how to talk about it. So it was something that I, I kept very private. And then uh, sometime in my adolescence, one of the words that started surfacing in my family, family was Huntington's disease. And what we found out through some testing and uh, recognizing what was really going on with my mom is her mom had been diagnosed with Huntington's uh, when I was in high school. And uh, the mental health that my mom started to deal with when she was in her 30s or 40s um, evolved and in her early 50s, she was also diagnosed with Huntington's. So if you are familiar with Huntington's, it is a neurological disorder, there is no cure and uh, it shows up in your 30s and 50s. And it, it affects everything, uh, physical movement, cognition and uh, psychiatric piece to it. So uh, for me personally, my mom's manifested a lot with psychiatric care needs at the beginning that has intensified in my adult years. And I'm sure as some of you know, when you are familiar with and as Virgil uh, so eloquently described to us, caregiving takes significant toll on caregivers. And um, in, in my family in, in particular, we really didn't know what we were caregiving for, for many years. And one of the great tragedies out of my family that happened is my parents also got a divorce during that time. So caregiving very much came upon my sisters and I uh, starting in our 20s. And so my mom has been pretty high functioning with her Huntington's for the majority, uh, up until probably the last uh, five years. And so uh, going through a divorce that was also very traumatic and hard in our family, and then with something that I was not taught how to talk about, and then also being a mental health professional, you think that I would know how to do all of those things. And like Virgil said, it's very different when you're walking that road yourself. And so uh, I, I recognized that I needed to get a lot of support. And that, so through my own counseling, through spiritual direction, through being married to a man who is extremely supportive and starting to talk, I was able to move into a different role of, of support and being able to acknowledge the Huntington's in my family, it's also a genetic disorder. And so it's passed down genetically uh, from generation to generation. And so the caregiving in, in my story is unique in the sense that I am caregiving for my, my mother also uh, caring is, is this something that I will be walking a road to? So there's many, many layers of, of grief, of trauma, um, of anxiety, of how do I hold all of this? The hopelessness aspect of it, the fatigue, the guilt, am I doing enough while also trying to maintain my own mental health and my own um, physical health as I am moving forward in this? And so because my mom's uh, manifested a lot in the mental health piece, we were able to manage through a lot of medications at the beginning uh, after my parents' divorce. And she was able to live by herself. And then as the cognitive and the physical piece has altered over the last 10 years, we have moved into different uh, ways of caregiving. Right now, my, my youngest sister, so there's three of us, there's five years in between all our 
I'm the oldest and then there's five years for, to the youngest. So we're all pretty close in age. She's living with my mom right now. We just made that transition recently to my mom cannot live by herself any longer. Um, probably in the last 10 years, I've done a lot of the mental health bulk of it because of my profession, knowing the language. I really resonated with what Virgil was talking about of since I'm the mental health professional in the family, I can sit in the psych units, I can sit with the psychiatrist, I can advocate with the therapist, I know the medication language, and I have to detach from that, right? Because that's a lot to take on when I'm, I'm talking about that and it's my mom sitting there versus trying to put my clinical brain on. So that's been a very delicate balance that I have, um, I'm still learning as I walk that road with my mom. So um, after the divorce, one of the things that I took on, like I said, was the mental health aspect. And so my mom had a couple of different psychiatric stays and some of those were here in Houston. Some of those were other places. And I'm also, I'm also a mom and uh, working in school and also trying to show up for my family. So there was a lot of balancing that was messy and hard and I am still trying to figure some of that out. And so when Virgil was reading the mixed emotions of caregiving, y'all, those are words that I feel deeply, deeply every single day. And uh, the guilt, the resentment, the isolation, the frustration, who do I talk to about this? Uh, when you're in the middle of chronic, ongoing, long-term caregiving, uh, again, what Virgil was saying of, people don't ask very often, nor do I think I offer up a lot of information because it's super hard to give words to everything that I'm feeling every day with the caregiving. And so I've, I've found different outlets for that, which I'll, I'll share later. Um, but I, I, like I said, taking on the mental health piece and helping my mom navigate that has been a big part of my caregiving. Um, she has lived by herself and COVID took a massive toll on her and the isolation. And she was in a place that was considered independent living. She had her own apartment and all of her meals were provided for her and no one could come visit. And that took depression and her overall care in a very different way. And I can't describe how hopeless or helpless I have felt in this last year of being separated from her and trying to do caregiving while also trying to figure out space to have her in our homes and what that's going to look like, which took up large parts of real estate in my brain while I was also trying to show up for others in my practice and in my family. And so I don't have enough um, slices of the pie to give away. If when you look at a pie of how many things that you need to do, it's, it's just overwhelming. And so um, the decision was made this spring to move. My sister came back to Texas and they moved into a house together. I live in a small town house here in Houston and uh, with her physical needs, it wasn't gonna be possible. And I have moved into a supportive role of the caregiver um, who is supporting my mom. And again, very personal. And so even today in the middle of sessions, I was calling my sister because she was a, a, a conflict and crisis came up today with my mom. And so I'm calling her up, giving her support, sitting her within that, talking about Huntington's. It's also a very rare disease that very few people know about. And so again, trying to give language and get support. It just, the lie that I believe sometimes is that no one understands. And so trying to show it for my sister in between all of these, these places and, and talk to her and give her support while she's doing the, the brunt of the support um, in the physical sense right now. And so when, when Virgil asked me to be on this, I thought what a vulnerable piece that was because I think at least all the panelists that you're gonna hear, I mean, this is something that I stepped out of probably 30 minutes before I stepped on this, this screen and that I will step back into uh, when I leave. And so caregiving is something that I don't ever get to close off in my brain. It has evolved for me over time of the way that has looked and how active I am physically in that, that caregiving, but it, it is always something that I am thinking about, I'm giving energy about. I always feel like I'm not doing enough and that I could be doing more. And so those are things that I have to contend with. One of the things that I have resonated deeply, uh, two things that have come into my life 
that uh, give me great strength and great hope. My, my faith is significant in my life. Uh, believing that there is mystery and something bigger going on that, that's, that I can't see. And that something is working, God is working um, in and through me and in the caregiving. Uh, language that my spiritual director gave me is that I am stepping into caregiving with my mom and my story is, is interlacing with hers and the greater story that is being written in ways that I can see and that I cannot see right now. Uh, the mystery in that is something that I have learned to step into. And also really trying to take care of myself physically, mentally, spiritually, and getting other resources. Another thing my sisters and I have done just in the last couple months is we've invited a caregiver into our lives, a professional one who comes in and sits with my mom uh, for 12 hours a week so my sister can get some rest, so my sister can step away and do the things that she needs to do. It also offers my mom some independence because my mom is struggling with her daughters taking care of her. So that's another side that we've had to deal with and that we talk about openly and doesn't have uh, tidy answers we can give in a bow, in a package. So that is a little bit of my story and the mental health piece laced through it and that it is something that's not talked to, talked about very often. And that's something I've noticed in my caregiving is there's the physical piece, the medical, but that also there's, for those of us who are walking very closely um, with someone who's struggling with mental illness, that that is also uh, takes a big, a big piece of the caregiver. And that is something I find great joy sitting with others in my office of being able to sit with them and, and walk paths with them as they are walking paths with other people. So it is an ongoing journey that I am still learning from and will continue to learn from. Thank you, Chelsea. Rodney. Okay, you'll notice how technically astute I am uh, trying to unmute myself, but uh, again, Suzanne and I began this journey in earnest in uh, early 2015 uh, to determine if Suzanne's memory loss was just normal aging or something else. The doctors did not affirmatively declare that Suzanne had dementia until after a brand sca uh, brain, brain scan in July of 2017. It showed a buildup of plaque in the brain. There was a tremendous emotional toll imposed on Suzanne and I over that two year period, visiting 20 or more doctors and professionals to diagnose the source of her memory loss. After the final diagnosis, the doctors then wanted to do further tests to determine the type of dementia or Alzheimer's that she had. Uh, I refused further testing since knowing which particular type of of the four kinds of dementia or Alzheimer's would not really change uh, Suzanne's treatment regimen. I felt she really had been through enough. You can look back and you see the progression of her memory loss after the fact, but we were unable to see it at the time. Even with two doctors in the family, we did not notice it until her memory loss was visibly apparent. The numerous doctors that we consulted seemed to create more confusion rather than solving the problem. In many respects, the doctor visits and the testing, in my opinion, simply accelerated the memory loss. For two years, the doctors treated Suzanne's memory loss as caused by depression. Suzanne kept failing the dementia test because she still scored very high on the mathematical brain functions. Suzanne and I met at Harding University and married just after graduation in June, 1971. So in a few months, we'll be celebrating our 50th wedding anniversary.
were both the county majors. And in fact, Suzanne and I were the first married couple to sit for the CPA exam and both pass it on the first try. Women in accounting was rare in the 1970s. However, the bias against women in the 1970s uh, left, uh, worked against Suzanne and she left public accounting and we started our family a few years thereafter. Suzanne's lack of computer skills worked against her when the doctor ordered several computer-based testing evaluations. With her memory loss and lack of computer, uh, computer skills, the tests were emotionally devastating and she never completed any of the tests. The doctors then ordered testing by a neuropsychologist. We took two of those tests a year apart. Both times a neuropsychologist concluded that her memory loss was from depression. The tests were emotionally and physically debilitating. She physically could not walk to the car and was so emotionally drained, uh, she could not function. She realized for the very first time that she couldn't remember it, that she couldn't remember and that she could remember that she couldn't remember. So it became a reality for her. Suzanne had written the ladies Bible class curriculum for church for 15 years and led most of the discussions. Then all of a sudden she quit doing the lessons and quit attending class. Looking back, we realized that when she could not mentally develop the lessons, she quit rather than admit that there was a problem. Then she quit her bridge group and then she quit, she quit her bunco group. Suzanne was part owner in an upscale successful doll and teddy bear store in a major shopping center near the Texas Ranger and Cowboy Stadiums in Arlington. She made trips every year to New York for Toy Fair. Suzanne served on the board of trustees at Harding University for 13 years. She resigned and we finally concluded that because she made the trip for eight hours driving back and forth, she got confused as to the route and the turns. And so therefore she quit rather than continue. In early 2015, I had a medical procedure and my sister happened to come over for it. When I was still out, the doctor went over my new medications and what needed to be done for the following week. My sister was shocked that Suzanne did not retain any of the instructions. That's when the family realized that although Suzanne had some memory lapses, she could not sequence any activity knowing what to do first and what to do second. This was alarming. And this is when we really said, we've got to figure out what is the memory loss issue. It was difficult to get Suzanne to go to the doctor because she thought she was okay. She didn't really want to go and admit that there was a problem. She was angry. She was belligerent, which did not help the situation. Above all, I believe that she was embarrassed. She did not want anyone to know at church and especially other family members. Thus began our charade of trying to hide her memory loss. Our daughter is an oncologist. With her patients, you can see the cancer. With memory loss, it comes, it goes, and it could be caused by numerous factors. When your patient doesn't want to go to the doctor or doesn't want to know, it takes a toll on you and the patient. We learned that psychiatrists really don't want to talk to you. All they really want to do is prescribe medications to keep you calm and sedated. Being, over, being overly medicated is not a quality of life that's functional. Suzanne's treatments were complicated since so she can't swallow large pills. Trying to get prescriptions broken up into smaller dosages that she can swallow goes against insurance protocols, which causes new issues. When your patient's fighting against going to the doctor, it causes further anxiety, and you're trying to reduce anxiety med medication. More anxiety, more medication. It becomes a vicious cycle. 
I remember one instance when we were going to UT Southwestern Psychiatrist in Dallas, the trip would take 45 minutes to an hour to drive, which means I had questions every five minutes. Where are we going? Why are we going? Then she demanded that we didn't need to go since nothing really ever helped. When I finally got to the parking lot, it took me 45 minutes to get Suzanne out of the car. It was July and the temperature was over 100 degrees and the doctor was eight floors away. With the anxiety medications, the doctors are not allowed to prescribe them without seeing the patient. That was the dilemma. The one thing that you learn with memory patients is that you cannot get angry with them. When you do, then they have to deal with angry reactions and there's no communication. Susan would shut down in any conversation I had because I was angry at her. Suzanne had eight doctors at UT Southwestern and we had appointments Sundays, two a day. Then add the memory issues, Suzanne had nosebleeds that, nosebleeds that worsened from a hole in her septum from her childhood. This resulted in hours of nosebleeds that were difficult to stop and two trips to the emergency room. She ultimately had four units of blood and eight units of iron. Finally, the doctor said a surgical procedure to close the hole was necessary. The surgery is typically an afternoon day surgery. Suzanne's ended up into a four day hospital stay. Doctors suspected that Suzanne wasn't getting enough oxygen at night, but the overnight sleep test was a complete disaster. It took us three hours to get her from the car in the parking garage into the hospital. She was afraid that we were putting her into a nursing home. The anxiety from the attached wires and trying to go to the bathroom during the night finally canceled the test and we came home at three o'clock in the morning. Every nine months to a year, your challenges change. In 2017, Suzanne would sleep until one or two in the afternoon. So I could do errands, do volunteer work in the morning. I could check our home interior security cameras on my mobile app and determine when she was up and then I could come home. In 2018, Suzanne got hyper anxious about getting in a car. When I went to board meetings, I would usually take her to stay with one of our children. Suzanne tried to get out of the car while we were going 70 miles an hour on a freeway because she didn't want to go. She didn't want to be to dump her at the kids. So the six and eight hour trips to the kids were no longer possible. Now the children had to come and stay with her at home when I went to board meetings. In 2019, Suzanne started sundowning in the afternoons with anxiety and meltdowns. These could start as early as one or two o'clock, but usually occurred around four. She would start crying and want to go home to take care of her mother, who had passed away 15 years ago. We'd taken away her car keys in 2015 and sold the second car in 2019. Both events were traumatic, but only lasted a few weeks. If I don't keep up with Suzanne as to where she is, she will go to her closet when sundowning and grab a handful of clothes, stuff her purse with all her underclothes, come back, get a number of books and load the car. She gets in the car, but she's not able to start it. During this time, I'm pleading with her to come back into the house because the garage is either too cold or too hot. She will be crying and saying that she needs to go home. Finally, after two or three hours, she will be exhausted and come back into the house and sit down with no comment. Then I started locking the car doors, but found out that if you have the fob in your pocket and you get too close to the car, it opens all the doors. With a tar car door locked, Suzanne will simply walk around in circles, trying to, to open each car door for hours. This sundowning is still happening. We've changed around her medications to try to give anxiety medicine in the afternoons. In addition, I try to use the afternoons to run errands with Suzanne staying in the car, 
hoping that she won't get out. We try to keep her thinking about something other than herself. Now, if I miss the signals that she's sundowning and she wants to go home, I volunteer to take her someplace. I press her to give me directions to where she wants to go. Of course, she cannot do so. She finally realizes that she's having a meltdown. And so we drive around for a while until she calms down. This sundowning is real to Suzanne and she's overcome with sadness and anxiety. Although I probe as to what she's concerned about, she's not able to express her fears. We have to avoid anything that triggers anxiety and fear. So we can't watch the news, it's much too violent. We can't watch very much TV, it's much too violent. We do watch a lot of Hallmark movies and Perry Mason reruns. The nice thing with dementia is you don't ever remember what the ending is. My children worry that caring for Suzanne will shorten my life. It probably will. One way that I cope is to realize that there are so many other friends in worse situations than I am. I have faith that God will not give me more than what I can bear. If Suzanne becomes immobile, we will have to look at other alternatives. Suzanne and I are actually closer to each other probably than any other time in our marriage, but without the intimacy. The big stresses in this journey have been the doctor visits and the home health care workers. When we were able to get visiting physicians to come to the house, a great load of stress was removed from our day-to-day -day activities. Visiting physicians can continue the same medications that all the other doctors were prescribing without the trauma on Suzanne and myself. We've located a local catering business that prepares meals each day, and we can select what days that we want to pick up the meals. You see your partner in emotional pain that you cannot fix. Suzanne's schedule now is up at 9 or 10 o'clock in the morning and to bed at 9 or 10 o'clock at night. But I or someone have to be with her at all times. I can't leave her alone or she feels abandoned and extremely frightened. Then she gets angry that I've left her. I can't be upstairs cleaning for 30 minutes without her becoming frightened and angry. If I'm working on the computer on a project when I'm at home, even in the same room with her, but not engaged with her, she can become angry and have a meltdown. During the difficult times, I have to remind myself that I am the embodiment of the compassion and the patience of Jesus Christ. God has put me here to serve. Suzanne served me and our family, and now it's my turn to serve her. The isolation from the pandemic closures have had a huge negative effect on us. One of the positive effects is virtual services. First time in four years, Suzanne was go to church with me. And you can do church a couple of times during the week and she doesn't know that it's not Sunday. One of my biggest disappointments is the lack of her friends making a point to come by and see her. In our five year confinement at home, only two people have made a point to come see her. We have a large house, so I intentionally have Christmas parties and events so that people come to the house. Many times, Suzanne will not join us until half the time is gone before she'll come out of the bedroom. When she does join, she has a great time. So many people are afraid to come see a shut-in because they fear that they will find themselves in the same circumstances in the future. One of Suzanne's greatest joys during this time was when the playgroup moms from 1977 to 1980 all came and took her to lunch for three hours to catch up. These ladies had been friends when our children were small. She had a great time. I continue my life with involvement with four nonprofit boards, church work, and other interests. But how do you respond to someone who asks, is my mother dead? Why can't I remember that? Caregiving is messy with all the bodily functions that you have to deal with. 
but fear giving is rewarding when someone looks into your eyes and says, you are going to stay here with me, right? Our faith in God and his promises only remind us that this is not our home. So we will continue and God will continue to bless us. So powerful, Rodney. Thank you. Um, okay, Don. Oh, <laughs> Rodney, thank you for your beautiful story. Um, I think the message that I've learned in the 20 year journey that I've been on with my husband with his healthcare issues is that pain is pain and we all have our own pain and how each of us deals with our pain um, using the strengths that we have is all specific and individual to us. And it's realizing what the strengths we have and it's not looking at someone and saying, well, you're this kind of caregiver and I need to be that kind of caregiver. And it's really kind of owning the strengths that we have within us and utilizing the relationships that we have with the person that we're charged with caring for ultimately. Um, so I'm Don Landry and um, I'm highly moved right now. So my throat, my heart is like right here, Rodney. And it's, it's such a beautiful story. Um, mine is a love story also. Um, so my husband and I have been friends for half of our lives now. It's 25 years in January. He can tell you what I was wearing the first time he met me. I don't remember meeting him for another six months. And so if that tells you the relationship that we have, um, we met in the business environment. Um, unlike the rest of this panel, um, if there's that, that song from that kids sang, if you know one of these things is not like the other, that would be me. Um, I do not have the faith back, faith based uh, ministry background, nor do I have the counseling, uh, the professional counseling background like Chelsea does. I'm a business professional, and so um, if ever there was a caregiver that you did not want, it would be me. Um, you know, I lead with my brain, and then I figure out the emotions later. I have spent my 28 year, year career doing public relations, a lot of times doing crisis management. And what I've found is that I've had to apply the professional skills that I've had to my personal life. And so um, when we were in our early 30s, we weren't even married yet. My husband is an asthmatic. He's had asthma since he was six weeks old. Let me just kind of step back for a second. He is one of the healthiest people you will ever meet in your life. The dude has worked out you know, since he was like 14, 15 years old, sometimes six days a week, you know, twice a day and uh, eats skinless, boneless chicken breast and um, never smoke, never drank. And uh, has, but has asthma since he was six weeks old and has some genetic, um, um, his whole family has cancer. His whole immediate family has had cancer. And so his dad and his sister have passed away at young ages to cancer. His mom had cancer, but she's a, a survivor. And so um, when we were in our early 30s, he was trying out this new um, asthma drug and started having a reaction to it. It's like one in a 10 million person chance that you're going to have a reaction to it. And he did. And um, they, they, they ended up catching it quickly. By the grace of God, we have a lot of grace of God in our, in, in our story, in his story. And um, Virgil, I say, I say us. All right. It's, and when you're saying, you know, the caregiver, like we're going to the, we're going to the doctor's appointments and we're going to the, you know, because and especially during his cancer treatment, it, I lost my identity in in that. And that's another piece of us. But um, fortunately, there was one in four. There was this beta trial um, for, from this um, the syndrome that he ended up with called Guillain-Barre syndrome. So it invoked stroke-like symptoms in him, usually it puts the person in a coma. There was one in four um, machines in the entire United States and they just happened to have one here in Houston at the hospital that he went to in the emergency room. And they did something called plasmapheresis whereby, whereby they wash your blood out and put it back into your body. He stayed in ICU for five days and then had physical and occupational therapy from there. I learned a huge lesson during that time in that um, information is good, information is power, but it also can mean 
that ultimately you can get information overload and it can get very scary. So you have to learn when to shut the laptop and rely on the advice and counsel of those good doctors that you, you have overall. Um, so then he recovered from that. And then we were 38 years old and he had a lump in his neck and he ended up going to the doctor, had strep throat. Doctor said, I want you to go to the ENT whenever you're over strep throat. Ended up being um, stage four cancer, squamous cell carcinoma. MD Anderson is, is a wonderful place. And so he had a very aggressive reg regimen of, he had um, tonsillectomy, tried to find the primary, not, never find the, found the primary. So they blasted him in his head and neck area. He had six weeks of chemo, seven weeks of radiation where he was going five days a week. It was very aggressive. Um, he lost 85 pounds. Um, he did not get, he was very um, determined not to be put on a feeding tube. During that time, um, I was brought to my knees. I didn't, I didn't, wasn't equipped in any way, shape or form to handle something like this. And I learned a lot of really important lessons during that time. First of which is let people help you. So we have a big network, you know, our family is all back in Louisiana. But we have a strong business network. He's in the banking industry. I was in the commercial construction industry. I own my own consulting firm now. Um, but uh, at, you know, through the years we've been in Houston almost, well, it's 20 years this year that we're in Houston. Through the years, we have this strong support network. And so people were emailing me and saying, what can we do? What can, can, what can we do? And I said, oh, you know, just pray for us, just pray for us. And the reality is people wanna be part of your journey. And so it was actually one of my family members, best friends who was on that email chain who contacted me, she's also a cancer survivor. And she said, people aren't offering just to offer, just to be nice. They want a part of your journey. Can you let them carve out something? they be very specific in what your needs are, carve out something for them to do. So then that way they can be, they can have a piece of your story. And it was really interesting when I started like listing out, these are the areas that we need help how many people signed up and how creative they got. I have a friend that's an interior um, design architect. She came to my house and decorated our house for Christmas and with all of our decorations, but she said, I know you're not gonna have the energy to do it. So let me do this for you. So it's amazing the creativity they got, but the lessons that I got in the middle of all of that too. And um, I was so exhausted. I never thought that a person could be so exhausted in all of their lives. So I started this, this prayer every morning. I had no energy other than to say, God, give me enough grace to get through today. And I just knew that I wanted the manna for today. And if I could get up and get through that day, then at the end of the day, I would thank him for that day. And that's what literally got me all through those weeks because I would wake up during his, the radiation part of the, of the treatment, I wake up at, you know, 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning, get fully dressed for work. We had the 6.30 appointment at MD Anderson for radiation. i get him into radiation. We lived in Spring Branch at the time. I'd swim back upstream through the Galleria, drop him off at home. He stayed at home. Our dogs were his caregivers for the day. And then I actually would go into work and put a full day's work in and just, you know, churned over and over again. And fortunately, we had some family that came in towards the end of it to help me. But the amazing piece of all of that was, and then the piece of it that no one tells you is that once we found out that he was cancer free, and like for many, many months following it, I went into a deep depression. I actually sought counseling for it. Not a lot of people know that, but um, I lost my identity in the middle of it. I became the woman whose husband had cancer. And that's all, and it, it, it's a great thing that people wanna talk about it, but that's all they wanted to talk about. And there was nothing left for me in there. And I felt guilty about it, but that was the piece of it that was missing overall. And so when I have give advice to caregivers is keep something for yourself. 
I love that time. It bonded us even closer in terms of our relationship. It made our marriage much stronger, but it also, I lost something of me in there that I had to go back and reclaim. So fast forward, we're almost at the 10 year mark of cancer free, excuse me. It's November of 2019. You know, when you get all of the treatments and everything and you just kind of sign your life away as a patient, you know, you have side effects, right? No one really pays attention to those. I mean, you do, but you don't, especially 10 years later. And so what we didn't realize is that he was a ticking time bomb. And so at 48 years old, um, he had a stroke and it was a very severe stroke in that he was fine one minute. I had talked to him a half an hour before the stroke. This is November, two days before um, Thanksgiving, two years ago, almost two years ago. And he was completely fine. And then he wasn't. And so fortunately, and this is how great God is, right? Um, my uncle moved in with us eight years ago. And we thought we were moving my uncle in to help him. The reality was my husband was working from home that day. I got off the phone with him. He then had a conference call for work. He walked into the kitchen. My uncle said he was making some like really unusual noises in the kitchen. So my uncle left the living room, walked to the kitchen and he looked at Darren and he said, are you okay? And Darren had a glazed look over his face. And he said, Darren, what's your name? And he didn't respond. Darren, what's my name? And he couldn't respond. And then he started slouching and my uncle helped him to the floor immediately grabbed his phone, got the ambulance to our house. The paramedics were in our house within 15 minutes. If you know anything about stroke, there's a two hour window. There's a drug called TPA. Don't ask me what it stands for. Um, Cause I, I know a lot about medicine these days. I know I, I, it's, I touch the tops of the trees at this point, but um, they got him to the hospital in enough time to get it into his system. But he was 100% paralyzed on his right side and he couldn't speak. And so here I am, the unintentional caregiver that not only that not only, you know, doesn't feel equipped to be a caregiver, but now I have to do everything, all the bodily functions, and I have to speak for him. And so, and he couldn't speak for months. And so, and I got it all wrong a lot. And so he spent 26 days in the hospital. Um, two stents in ICU. The first stent, um, they went in and he was 100% clogged. As If you know of anyone who has head and neck um, radiation, there's a side effect from it. It's fine. I'm so happy that we caught it in time by God's grace, but um, there's a side effect that um, the radiation actually hardens the arteries there. So he was one, he was 100% blocked. So they got it, they got it flowing again. But um, that surgery was intense. It was supposed to be an hour long surgery. It ended up being four hours long. And, um, you know, I love, I love our friends in Houston because they're very stubborn. They're like me. And when I was texting and asking for prayers, they were like, Dawn, I'm going to come and meet you. And I'm like, no, it's okay. If, you know, our, some of our family was coming in from Dallas and somebody was coming in from Louisiana. And I said, no, it's all right. You know, Scotty, you'll be here in a few hours. And all of a sudden I had six people in the waiting room with me that were just there. And it's amazing to me how much I needed them because, um, that one hour surgery turned into a four hour surgery and I was okay an hour two. And then an hour three, I started to start pacing. And then an hour four, I really started to get nervous. And um, it was really hard because the doctors told us some really challenging things about things that might happen, but with a lot of prayer, they never did. But he woke up and he was very scared and he cried for he cried for days. And what I had to do was get in the bed with him and look him eyeball to eyeball and say, I'm not going anywhere. I don't know what you're conjuring up in your head, but you can't get rid of me that easily. And sometimes that's what our patients need the most is to know that no matter what, we're gonna be there with them. Um, 
because like Rodney, you know, even though it's hard, you're still, you're in it and they, they need you the most. And so um, he made it to inpatient rehab, started physical, occupational and speech therapy. And then he had a reaction to one of the drugs whereby he started vomiting blood and so much blood I had never seen. And we almost lost him that day and everything that he's been through. I never thought that I was going to lose him, but his blood pressure dropped from 80 to 80 over 80 over 42 or something like that. Rushed him back to the hospital and he ended up, um, he ended up having uh, another surgery. So suffice it to say that I've learned a lot of lessons through all of this. The thing that I've learned the most is that um, we are here for a reason. And the thing that I continue to tell him is that he is here for a reason. It's to inspire and to motivate others with his story that God has a purpose for him. But that's also the reason why I wrote my book is the lessons that I learned in the journey that we've had through these three illnesses and the love story that we have overall also is to share the journeys that we have so that we can help other people. Oh, well, this is uh, when you feel like you're on sacred territory, when you hear these three stories. I mean, it's amazing. Some similarities um, of being put into this, but also conscious decisions to, to make choices to stay with this person. All three of you hit upon that. Uh, all three of you uh, talked about your faith life, maybe in different ways, but that, that you had to have that to sustain you. Uh, I, I love the fact when you get it down to one day at a time, as, as you did, Don, it just get me through today. Uh, uh, you know, some, some very wise people have said that, and uh, it, it, to me, it's the only way to get through it, but my mind doesn't normally work that way. I start jumping ahead. Well, what's going to be a week from now? What's going to be six months from now? And the truth is I have today and that's it. Uh, so what can I do? What do I have to say over that? Uh, each one of you have uh, struggled, been very open with your struggles about it, uh, to, to, uh, to deal with anger and depression and resentment. Rodney, when you talk about trying to get Suzanne out of the car, I'm just thinking, wow, you know, to take that long uh, just to try to get her to the doctor's office so they could help her and, and all the negotiating you had to do before you ever got in there, even in the building. I, I mean, that really uh, describes well uh, the stuff that, that you didn't have planned that day, I bet, and uh, yet you did it. Uh, Chelsea, how, how you have not only done things as a child, but now you're using your skills um, to be supportive to your sister and trying to problem solve and and what I appreciate about you is, is when you said I'm still learning. So that's what caregivers have to do. We're learning on the fly. Uh, and uh, it's, it's just uh, very powerful. I, I'm grateful to all of you and I'm sure all of you that have heard this today are. So uh, I'm gonna close uh, with getting back to screen sharing and uh, then we're going to close with a, uh, a poem and Steve Thorny is going to close us with a song about being connected. Okay, now where'd I go? Presentation three. Oh, gosh, I hate computers. Stand by. Virgil, you can probably just hit that little PowerPoint icon, that that red circle with the P. Okay. That should bring you up. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. All right. Here's what I uh, came up with, and it matches perfectly what you three have shared. First of all, find some time for yourself. Whatever that means to you, if you're in the caregiving mode, you just have to find time uh, to breathe. Uh, you know, even Rodney, with with all you have going on, you say you go upstairs to clean, you know, you may have 30 minutes. Well, uh, 
but that's all you've got. Uh, you still have to take it. Acknowledge that feeling guilty, angry, and a sense of loss is normal. Some people really beat themselves up for that. Uh, I know I did at times, and I thought, okay, what's wrong with you? Why can't you just keep sucking it up and get on? We're human beings. Um, and if the roles were reversed, I can imagine that Carol would have felt that about me as well at times. And it's okay. Uh, find refreshing things you can do, even if it's just a few minutes. Uh, one time when my son was in intensive care at age 13 in Texas Children's, I remember vividly having to get out of the intensive care. I think it was like two or three in the morning. And I went outside and walked around that sidewalk that comes down main. Uh, and I still remember the, the Texas Children's uh, logos that was in the yard there and everything about it. But I just had to find ways to remember there's a world still going on besides what Carol and I were dealing with with Kyle in the hospital. So for me, short walks, uh, just being outside kind of recommits who we are. Um, meditating, uh, praying, reading scripture or encouraging passages, short things, uh, naps, that all of that can bring a sense of refreshment. Sounds very simple. And yet sometimes you have to make yourself find time to do that. Ask for help. Uh, Dawn beautifully talked about that. Uh, she had to learn to ask for help. And then when she did it, it actually worked out pretty good, didn't it? Uh, ask for a visit with a non judgmental friend. I don't need somebody to come in and tell me what I need to be doing. They just need to hear me and my story. And uh, those kind of friends are a treasure. Ask for someone to stay with the patient for your own sake. Uh, I think all three of you have had to do that at times. And then sometimes when you're the case manager, you need to ask medical providers very direct questions. What, what is this? Acknowledge that your energy and attention level is taxed and your ability to complete regular tasks is compromised. And that's okay. If nothing else, just remember those last three words. That's okay. <laughs> Let me read this poem and then I'm going to ask Steve, if he will, to uh, share a song that's by Noel Paul Stuckey of Peter, Paul and Mary. We actually got to hear him perform this in a, in a private concert one time. This is from our presence. Life is, life is good. Life is hard. It should say not life is God, but life is good. Add another O. This is what all three of you have described. We stumble on those who hurt so deeply they dare not believe for fear of betrayal or loss. We problem solve or listen or pray the pain will go away. Day after day, we wait to see what may never be, wholeness. Yet we must wait and stand beside, for it is a steady hand, the repeated kindness, the patient ear, which may bring hope. Those who suffer do not need our answers. They need our constancy even when we're tired or rejected or confused. We who believe in an everlasting presence give the best help by saying, whatever happens, I'll be there. All of our panelists have said this in their own way. And I'm grateful for you sharing your vulnerable stories with us uh, and pray that you will continue to find the strength you need in your current battles. So Steve, if you will uh, perform for us Facets of the Jewel, this is a very poetic song, but the main thing it talks about is our need for connectedness. And I'll stop sharing and uh, let Cyrus focus in on Steve. Virgil, thank you so much. And just my incredible gratitude to you, Chelsea and Rodney and Dawn for the powerful, powerful stories that you shared of your life tonight. Uh, as I've listened to, to Chris preparing to talk next week from the perspective of the a person dealing with a chronic illness and uh, just hearing your powerful stories of caregiving and both of us have been so in touch with uh, unexpressed grief that Virgil was talking about a little bit earlier and it just kind of piles up on you and so I'm feeling a little teary this evening. Uh, I'm reminded of a book that Kenneth Houck who founded the Stephen Ministries wrote it was called Don't Sing Songs to a Heavy Heart. Uh, and I guess I'm feeling a little bit of that right now, but 
but also at the same time with this incredible gift that we have called Zoom uh, to be connected with each other by, by that technology, but by God's grace and spirit. So I, I shared this song with you that Paul Stuckey wrote a number of years ago. Our lives are connected like facets of a jewel. The reluctance of a wise man, the wisdom of a fool. They border on each other, sometimes kind, sometimes cruel. Our lives are connected like patches on a quilt. Sown by a coincidence, some borders edged in guilt. Though every choice we make creates a different pattern, still our lives are connected. And who to say the universe is but a single thought contained within the mind of God and who's to say it's not if love is the lesson how was the teacher taught Our lives are connected like waves upon the shore, sometimes with a whisper, sometimes with a roar, sometimes we think we leave no trace, sometimes less is more. are connected like pages on a book. The past is the present through which the future looks like leaves on a river, like ripples on a brook. Our lives are connected. Cyrus, we'll turn it back to you and let you uh, finish out. If you would provide your uh, email address in case anybody has further comments or questions and you can get them to the right people. Thank you. Well, thank you, Steve. And thank you, Rodney. And thank you, Don. And thank you, Chelsea, and thank you, Virgil. I will put my email in the chat um, for any needs that any of you have. I think it's appropriate that we close maybe in the way we began with just a minute of silence. Taking this opportunity to close your eyes if that's comfortable. And just let it soak in. Whatever showed up for you. Whatever parts of the story are also parts of your story.
making space right now to feel and allow yourself to feel. All the experiences that you've had of caregiving, of caring. Feel into how much you care. And from that warm place, see if in this moment you can extend that care to yourself, perhaps placing a hand on your heart. Acknowledging all you've experienced and allowing yourself to say, and that's okay. And that's okay. It's okay. Feel the soft rise and fall of your own breath. You can stay right there or open your eyes. Wherever you are, feel the sense of connection that we have to those we love and to one another. May you all be blessed. And thank you again to our speakers, to Virgil, to all of you. Be well. Take care of yourselves and see you next week.